Um, so, good evening to everyone. So, I'm uh, very happy to be back again in Singapore uh, for tonight's talk. And um, uh, for this series of talks, um, we will be talking about the uh, book on uh, humanistic Buddhism holding true to the original intents of the Buddha. And for this session tonight, uh, I'll be touching on chapter 4. And chapter 4 is basically divided into three parts. And I'll be talking uh, on the first part. And then um, the next two months, you have part two and part three. Okay, so uh, in the book, uh, Verbal Master uh, started off by introducing how Buddhism began in China. So um, do you still remember who was the emperor? And uh, he's actually Emperor Ming of the Eastern Han Dynasty. And that year was year 64. Okay, um, so he had this dream of this golden man. Uh, and then his minister told him that in the West, uh, that he saw in his dream. So he told him that that was the Buddha. Okay, so Emperor Ming went um, and dispatched his envoy um, to go to the West. Um, and in the text is the Western region, and it's what we know as the Central Asia, uh, in today's Central Asia. Okay, in Chinese it's called Si Yu, right? But that region is actually Central Asia. All right, and so that was how um, Buddhism began from there. Okay. Okay. Um, and then uh, Reverend Master went on um, to talk about daily routine in the first section of the chapter. So he started off with food, and then he goes on to talk about clothing, housing, and traveling. Right. And um, I think it began with these four um, things, because these are the daily uh, necessities. Um, that we need to come across in our daily life. And so I guess that was why Verbal Master started off with uh, these four um, areas. And um, in, during the Buddha's time, the Buddha also talked about these four things. Okay, but um, except for traveling, um, instead of traveling, uh, uh, the Buddha talked about medicine. And in the Vinaya, he also talked about um, how you should regard, how monastics should regard uh, these four things. Okay, so uh, the first one is on the rope. So with regard to the rope, uh, the monastic should use it simply to ward off cold, heat, flies, mosquitoes, and simply for the purpose of covering the, the parts of the body that cause shame. Okay, so the use of the rope is very simple. Uh, is not used uh, to beautify your body, but to use um, to keep away from any kind of discomfort, and also just uh, as a, 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 a attire to cover the body. Okay, and then with regard to alms food, um, the Buddha said that you should use it not playfully. That means you should regard the food with respect. Okay, because. Um, during the Buddha's time, the monks had to go out for alms begging. And um, whatever food they are given, they should uh, take in with gratitude and um, not with uh, a kind of disrespect. Okay. And the Buddha say no intoxication. All right. Uh, so no alcohol, no drugs, etc. And not for putting on weight. Okay. So monks are not allowed to overeat. They only they are only allowed to eat um, in order to support the body, just enough to support the body, not for beautification. Okay, that means you don't take pills that will slim you down. Um, you don't take anything, you know, that will boost certain parts of your body. Yes, things like that. But simply for the sake of keeping the body um, free from hunger. Okay, 
And so uh, simply for survival and continuance of this body, for ending its afflictions, for the support of the chaste life. Right. And so uh, the monastic should maintain themselves, be blameless, and live in comfort. Okay, so that's what the Buddha said about alms food. And then with regard to lodging, um, it's quite similar to uh, what the Buddha said uh, with regard to clothing. So to ward off cold, heat, flies, mosquitoes, wind, sun, and reptiles. So it's the same to keep the body away from it, discomfort. And for protection from the weather and also for the enjoyment of seclusion. Okay, so the, the, the place that they choose for their lodging is actually a secluded place, okay, away from the bustling and hustling of a city. Um, and they have enough seclusion so that they can do their own meditation at the monastery. And with regard to medicine, it's for um, curing the sick, okay, curing the illness. Uh, you use them for, to ward off any pains of illness that have arisen and for the maximum freedom from disease. Okay, so um, that was the four uh, requisites that the Buddha said uh, with regard to uh, food, clothing, lodging, and medicine, right? Okay, right, um, and in this chapter, the uh, Verbal Master actually talked about traveling, right? So I guess I will start off with traveling. Okay, so as we saw in... Um, uh, during the Buddha's time, the Buddha uh, traveled around India um, to beg for alms, to beg for food, and also to give teachings to different people. Right, so traveling is a very important aspect of the Buddha's life. Okay, because of traveling, the, Buddha's, the, the teachings of the Buddha got spread to different places and to different people. Uh, and then uh, it's also because of traveling that Buddhism spread to other parts of the world. Okay, so as we saw in the video, um, in the year 64, Buddhism was spread into China. Okay, so after Emperor Ming of Eastern Han Dynasty, after he had this dream, he dispatched his envoy by the name of Tsai Ying to the Western region to search for the Dharma. And Tsai Ying went to this place called Da Rou Zhi. All right, uh, Da Rou Zhi is no longer existing in today's uh, world, uh, but if you look into the text, it was a place that exists in the Central Asia, and so probably somewhere in Xinjiang, right? But this place is no longer existing, and you can only find reference in ancient texts. And he went there, and then he found two monks. Two monks came back to China with him. One was Kasyapa Matanga, the other one was Dharma Ratna. And they were said to have traveled on a white horse, um, bringing also the scriptures with them. And they ended up in White Horse Temple. Okay, so uh, that was the very first temple in China and a very important symbol of Chinese Buddhism. That was where Chinese Buddhism began. Okay, and then um, uh, Chinese Buddhism went through many uh, dynasties until the Cultural Revolution and also there was this inner war and conflict in China and many of the Chinese monks they started to go to other places right so for example Taiwan and Venerable Master was one of the monks who traveled to other places and came to Taiwan and then he started establishing humanistic Buddhism in Taiwan and um, and then later on, Verbal Master started the um, BRIA, and he started to set up branches in different parts of the world, including Singapore and Malaysia. Okay, and that's why we have a very beautiful branch temple here, and also in uh, many parts of Malaysia. And I can see that you know from the number of people attending this session tonight, I can see that Buddhism Buddhism is prospering um, and are flourishing um, in Singapore and Malaysia. Okay, so uh, let's start off with um, what the Buddha was doing during the Buddha's time. 
So um, he went to travel on food and to, give, to seek for alms and to give teachings. And there was actually one particular sutra in the Chinese canon. It's called Chang O Han Jing. And in Chang O Han Jing, there is this sutra called Yu Xing Jing. Okay. And this sutra talks about what the Buddha, where the Buddha was traveling and what are the teachings that he gave during his travels just before he passed into Parinirvana. Okay, so if you're interested, you can also look up this particular sutra. And it has records of the places that he went to and also the teachings that he gave. So, um, what are the places that the Buddha went during the Buddha's time? Uh, if you look at this map of India on the bottom left corner, um, the Buddha was mainly traveling in northeastern part of India. Okay, so um, this is uh, a bigger version of this northeastern part of India. Um, he was born in Lumbini, and we know Lumbini is in now Nepal. Right? And his hometown is Kapilavastu. Okay? He, began, he, he belonged to the Sakya clan. And the Sakya clan is in Kapilavastu. Okay? And then um, uh, after he left his home, um, he went and attained enlightenment in Bogaya, which is here. Right? And then he gave his first teaching in Sanaf, in Deer Park, to the first five disciples in this place, right? And then he started to travel around northeastern part of India. Um, for example, Rajagaha, this is one surgeon, right? This is uh, where he gave a lot of his, of his teachings, and also Vaisali. And then Sankasya is where he came down from the heavens. And then finally, uh, at the end of his life, he traveled to Kushinagara and he passed away. Okay, so these are some of the places that he went to and they were mostly in northeastern India. Okay. Okay, and when Buddhism was spread into China, um, this, this practice of traveling by food, uh, we call in Chinese, xin jiao duo bo. Okay, xin jiao means to go on food, to travel on food. And tuo bo means to seek for alms, right? Okay, but um, in Chinese Buddhism, uh, it is not part of the culture in China to seek for alms. Okay, so there, there isn't really tuo bo, there is mostly xin jiao. Oh. But um, in Chan Buddhism, xin jiao is also a... Uh, uh, Quite different, quite done, uh, done in a quite different way. Uh, so instead of begging for alms, the monks travel from monastery to monastery, okay, to seek for teachings, um, to seek for the right teacher, etc. Okay, so and there is a period of time where the monks would travel between Ma Zhu Dao Yi's monastery in Jiangxi and Shi Hou Xi Qian's monastery in Hunan. Okay, so there's one monastery in Jiangxi and the other one is in Hunan. And so that's why they say Pao Jianghu. Okay, that means um, the Jianghu Romans, okay, they go to Jiangxi and Hunan in between these two monasteries. And so many people, when they watch the TV drama, they say Pao Jianghu means travel around the world. Okay, but actually, um, it actually came from this Chan Buddhism and it means to travel between these two monasteries, okay? And I was very curious whether there were any um, monks in China who actually did what the Buddha did during the Buddha's time, like they travel and seek for alms, right? Um, so we know that um, uh, in, in Chinese Buddhism, they, they don't have this tradition of Tuopo, okay? But, um, but they actually go to the dining hall. So the process of 
seeking for arms. In China, it was transformed into um, going to the dining hall instead. Okay, he came out. Right. Um, yeah, I got this from the internet. Uh, this is a, a group of nuns who um, have this practice of arms procession um, for two weeks in China. Uh, and you can see they are carrying their own backpacks and they have their own sleeping mat and then they carry a staff. Okay, and um, they walk for two weeks um, and they follow the tradition of the Buddha. Okay. Uh, and this, this particular temple is in Liaoning province in northeastern China. And um, they are not allowed to take money. They are only allowed to beg for alms or beg for food. And they are not allowed to touch the money. So that's following the precepts that the, the Buddha has laid down. And um, they also, the temple doesn't have a donation box. Okay. And uh, they only eat once uh, at noon. And they only sleep for four hours a day. Um, they meditate, they do a lot of meditation. And um, they meditate for um, what it takes for to burn five incense. So I guess that's probably at least five hours. And they would go for the um, pilgrimage, uh, which they call angia. Angia is actually a Japanese term, which means sing jiao. Okay. They go for this um, procession uh, every year after the mid-autumn festival. And they have done it for the past 17 years. Okay, they started in year 2000 and they have um, been doing this for the past 16 years, 16 to 17 years. Okay, so these are some of the photos um, that were shown um, on the article. This is uh, devotees showing respect to uh, the, the nuns. And then when they come across any dead animals, they would bury it. Right, like uh, this one, I, be, I believe he has been run over by a car. Okay, and so they will pick them up and then they will bury it. And then they will dedicate the merits to the dead animals. And also they perform some uh, rituals uh, along the way. And uh, they also um, do their meditation uh, and they are, they only collect food, so uh, they don't they don't have any um, money. They don't carry any money. Okay, so this this is um, the food that they collected, and then um, eating, having their meal at noon. Okay, so it's like a sort of going, um, trying to uh, lead the life of the Buddha uh, during the Buddha's time. Okay, uh, reading the sutras, uh, and then they have uh, uh, some write their journals or they do their drawings. And then they, they sleep uh, on the street. Uh, they don't go to the temple to rest. Uh, and they find uh, along the way, as they are doing their pilgrimage, they find uh, a place to sleep on the street. Okay, yeah. So, this this is um, this is quite rare in China, uh, because most of the temples they don't follow the tradition of the Buddha um, begging for alms uh, anymore. So uh, this is a pretty rare example, um, and uh, it's quite it's quite uh, it's quite surprising to find this uh, that they're actually Chinese nuns doing uh, such a practice. Okay, so. Uh, we know that the uh, pr uh, the practice of Tuo Po has um, been transformed. Um, instead of seeking for alms, the monastics, they would go to the dining hall to get their food. Okay. And so going to the dining hall, um, walking to the dining hall, they have to line up. Right. And you have to line up in a formation uh, such that... Um, you, you have to be aware and mindful of the people that, are, that is walking 
around you. Okay, so that is that kind of walking, that mindfulness practice in walking, is uh, to have a good grasp of timing and space in itself. So that itself is a mindfulness practice. Okay, and as you are walking to the dining hall, you should also have the attitude that you are seeking for ounce. Okay, so uh, it's not like you are going to the restaurant and having a meal. Uh, you have to carry the attitude that you are um, going to receive offering uh, from from um, whoever is making the offering. Okay, so uh, Chinese Buddhism uh, they have what we call pai pan, okay, and jingxing, right? So forming, um, lining up information and doing the walking meditation. Okay, so uh, in Chinese Buddhism they say walk like the wind. Sit like the bell, stand like the pine, and recline like a bow. Okay, so in Chinese, that's sing ru feng, zuo ru zhong, li ru song, wo ru gong. Okay, so that's the four demeanors that a, a monastic should have, um, and how they should conduct themselves. Okay. Okay. Next, I'll, I'm going to talk about food. So this. Practice of Tuopo has been localized, and it is called Guo Tang in Chinese Buddhism. Guo Tang means to pass through the hall, right? So, what does it mean by passing through the hall? It means that we should be detached to whatever we are given. Okay, so if you have a very delicious green curry, you should be detached, right? Or if you have something that's horrible and terrible to eat. You should also remain detached. Okay, so the practice is to be detached to whatever you are given, and so we have、um, these five contemplations. Or in Chinese, we say wu guan xiang. And、um, the five contemplations、uh, involve being grateful for what you are given, and to、um, to re to to reflect on your own cultivation. Okay, so、uh, in in Chinese, we say yin gong. Okay, in gong means to be worthy of what you are offered. Okay, so、uh, another term of the arahat is in gong. Okay, that means、um, to be worthy of the offering, you need to be an arahat. Okay, so、um, the practice of guo tang is also to reflect on your own cultivation.、Uh, that means you 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 haven't been worthy of the offering. And so you should reflect on your own cultivation, and、um, and also to be this、uh, to to be、uh, unbiased towards what you are given, and、um, and you should think that you are taking in this food for the sake of maintaining this body for the spiritual practice. Okay,、uh, so in、uh, Chinese Buddhism, the dining hall we call we also call it Wu Guan Tang. That means a hall where we do the five contemplations, all right. And we know、uh, during the Buddha's time that we don't eat after lunch. Ah,、uh, no, we don't eat after noon, right? The midday meal is、um, taken before noon. Okay, that's because of a particular precept. And、um, but in Chinese Buddhism, that's quite difficult. Okay, because in India the monks do a lot of meditation, and they can survive without the、uh, an extra meal. They can get by、um, with uh, uh, having a meal by the midday. But in Chinese Buddhism, the monks don't go for alms begging, and they have to grow their own food. Right, they have to、uh, sustain. Um, their own meals, like they have to、um, do farming, and so there's a lot of manual work involved. Okay, and so there was this additional meal that's added to the day, and that meal was regarded to be a medicine instead of a proper meal. Okay, so you notice、um, we don't we don't、uh, we don't actually wear our robes when we go to the dining hall for the Uh, for the medicinal meal, okay, we only wear the robes when we go for the morning and the midday meal. 
and we don't uh, because that the, the extra meal that's added, what we call dinner, is actually a kind of medicine. Okay, it's not supposed to be a proper meal. Okay. And uh, this medicinal meal in Chinese we call yao shi. Okay, shi is stone, right? And so in, when I was in the Buddhist college, I used to wonder, why is it that this meal is called yao shi? Why is it that we eat a stone for dinner? Is a stone edible in the first place? And why do we eat a stone? So I was wondering, so I went to check out. And um, according to the dictionary, for one dictionary, um, for the Chan Buddhist practitioners, uh, they would place a heated stone on the stomach um, to ward off the cold and to ward off hunger. Okay? And so this... Um, stone was a symbol of that medicinal meal. Okay, and so um, the medicinal meal was in Chinese is, is called uh, yao shi. And uh, of course, in some places, uh, you, in some case, you can also call it yao shi, shi, shi wu de shi. Okay, but uh, yao shi actually came from this, this story whereby the, the monks actually put a heated piece of stone um, to get rid of the hunger and the cold. I've never tried that, but I think you can try that and see for yourself. Okay, so what's a Buddhist diet? Uh, or in Chinese, we call zai cai. Right? Uh, zai actually means qing jing, or it means purity. Huh? And um, during the Buddha's time, the Buddha said that um, there should be no killing. He emphasized this as one of the precepts. Okay? And uh, that the food should be prepared based on non-violence, ahimsa. Okay, the Buddha didn't say that you have to be a vegetarian, right? And the Buddha himself also took took meat. Um, but he did say that if you need to take meat, it should be triply clean meat, or what we call in Chinese san jing rou. Okay, and so what does it mean by san jing rou? What does it mean by triply clean meat? It means that this meat that is prepared for you, it should not have been seen. This animal should not be seen to have been killed. And it should not have been hurt. Uh, you, should not, you should not have been hurt to, uh, to have it killed for you. And it should not be suspected to have been killed uh, for you. Okay, So that was the condition that the Buddha said for the monastics, if they need to take meat. Okay, and then the Buddha also said that there should be no alcohol uh, because that would disturb your meditation and also it would also, you will also, you might lead you to breaking the other precepts if you do not have a clear mind. Okay, so no alcohol. And then the Buddha also said that no five pungent spices. Okay, so no onions, no garlic, etc. No, no wu xing in Chinese. Yeah, wu xing. Um, so, um, why, why is it that the Buddha said that there should be no five spices? Okay, uh, according to um, Lan Yan Jing, uh, it says that if these five spices is cooked, it might lead to, it might lead to greed, um, an attachment. If these five spices is eaten raw, it might lead to anger and hatred. And uh, if you're taking these five spices, the gods will stay away from you. Like the beings in the heavenly realms will stay away from you. And the beings, the hungry ghosts, will lick your, your lips. Um, they like the taste of these five spices. So they will come close to you. Okay. And so, um, you know, if you eat that, if you have this habit of eating these five spices, then you would have the company of these hungry ghosts. You know, and then gradually your merits from spiritual practice would decrease um, over the days. Okay. So, so we actually need to be very careful. We go, when you go to a vegetarian restaurant, uh, 
you know, in the West, there are many vegetarian restaurants. Um, even in, I think in Singapore, there's also a lot of vegetarian restaurants. But vegetarian restaurants doesn't mean it's a Buddhist diet. Okay, because a, a Buddhist diet is, you should not have the five spices inside. Okay, right. Um, yeah, and, and um, actually I recommend that uh, you can watch this uh, documentary. It's called Chef Table. Uh, it's on next Netflix. And uh, you can watch this particular episode, uh, the first episode of season three. Uh, it features a Korean nun called Jong Kwan. Jong Kwan. And uh, how she prepares a Buddhist meal. Okay, it's very interesting. And so uh, I highly recommend that you watch this if you have time. Okay, so what, what was it that the Buddha ate during the Buddha's time? Uh, somebody did a study and uh, he looked into the scriptures and he tried to see what was stated in the scriptures. Uh, so, uh, and he came up with this uh, list. So you have milk, right, rice porridge, uh, fresh ghee, wild rice, rice with grains, barley, meal, honey balls. Uh, curry, uh, rose, apple, mango, fruits, um, barley, lettuce, um, milk, uh, vegetables, and bread. Okay, so uh, although the Buddha didn't say that you have to be a vegetarian, but you can see from this list that he is quite close to a vegetarian, right? It's most of these things, uh, all of these things are actually vegetarian, isn't it? And what was, what was it that the Buddha ate most, if you look at this list? R rice, right? Rice and uh, fruits. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in Chinese Buddhism, the eating of porridge and congee was also emphasized. Okay. And in uh, Mohasan's Hiryu, that's Mahasangika Vinaya, uh, it says that the porridge or the congee has 10 benefits. Okay, that's why for the morning meal, we always sing the offering verse, right? Okay, that means the porridge has 10 benefits. It benefits the practitioner, it has limitless merits, and it brings about joy and comfort. Okay, so what are these 10 benefits? Okay, the first one, zi se, means you will have a good complexion. Uh, zhen li, that means it improves, gives you energy. Yi so, means it en enhances your longevity. An le, uh, brings about joy and comfort. Uh, bian shuo, uh, it means uh, it will... Um, Moisturize your throat and it's good for the giving a, a teaching or this course. Um, and it's also good for um, you know keeping the balance in your body and removing uh, air and uh, cold from your body. And then number seven, it's good for digestion. Number eight is that you will have a clear voice, clear and sweet voice. Number nine, it removes hunger. And number 10, it removes thirst. Okay, so these are the 10 benefits that was written in the Vinaya. And it encourages practitioners to eat porridge or congee. Okay, and uh, if you go to Fo Guan Shan, um, they always serve you with a bowl of porridge, right? And it's Vero Master's idea, Yi Zhou Dai Cha. Okay, so instead of the tea, they serve porridge. Um, that we call ping an zhou. And I think that was what was served to visitors. If you go to Dongchan Temple, uh, to the Di Shui Fang, at the Dongchan Temple, um, they would serve visitors with a bowl of porridge. Okay, so it's um, to benefit the practitioner. Um, and then also a gesture of welcoming the visitor. Okay, and we know in Chinese Buddhism, we have what we call la ba zhou, right? 
And uh, I believe all of you know what is La Bazo. Um, so literally, uh, La Bazo is, it means it's zo, uh, it's porridge with eight different kinds of ingredients. Okay. And uh, why is it called La Ba? What's the meaning of La Ba? La Ba means the eighth of the La month, right? And what, what, what does it mean by La? La Yue. Okay. And, okay, right. La actually means um, uh, offering, making an offering to your ancestors. Okay, it's, it's the month where they make an offering. Okay, so on the 8th of the La Yue, uh, we take in La Pa Zhou, right? And uh, we, it has eight ingredients to, to, to mean, to symbolize La Pa. Uh, um, and it is taken to commemorate the Buddha's enlightenment, okay? So because the Buddha, um, uh, the, the day when we celebrate the Buddha's enlightenment, in, the Chinese, in Chinese Buddhism, we celebrate it in um, the 12th lunar month, the 8th of the 12th lunar month, right? On that day, we call Fa Bao Jie, right? And we eat La Ba Zhou, right? Okay. But if you look into the scriptures, um, uh, the 12th lunar month is actually winter time in China, right? It's somewhere around January. We usually eat La Ba Zhou in January. So that's winter time. Of course, um, in Singapore, there's no seasons. But in Taiwan and China, that's winter time. Okay, but if you look into the scriptures, for example, Chang O Han Jing and Xian Zai, Guo Qi Xian Zai Ying Guo Jing, um, the Buddha was enlightened on the eighth of the second month. Okay, um, and in some scriptures, um, they say Si Yue Ba Ri, that means eighth of the fourth month. And then, uh, Da Tan Si Yue Ji, Zuo San Yue Ba Ri or San Yue Si Wu Ri. So, so it's somewhere between the second to the fourth month, right? If you look into the scriptures. And the second month to the fourth month is springtime, isn't it? But why do we eat in winter time? Why do we eat in winter time since the Buddha was enlightened in springtime when the flowers were blossoming and you know the weather is pleasant? Why do we eat? We, why do we eat? You don't know? Okay. Um, according to the um, text in the Song Dynasty, it's because during the Song Dynasty, they have a calendar called Zhou Li. That means the Zhou calendar. And the Zhou calendar um, starts from the 11th lunar month. Okay. And during the Song Dynasty, they follow the scriptures um, the Buddha was enlightened in Er Yue Chu Ba. Okay, so they follow this particular day, um, the eighth of the second month. And so they call the second month as La Yue. Okay, so the second month was named as La Yue. So La Yue becomes the second month, and it turns out to be the 12th lunar month. Okay, because they were following the Zhou calendar. And Zhou calendar starts on 11th lunar month. And so the second month becomes the 12th lunar month. Okay? And so that's why today when we eat La Bato, we eat on the 12th lunar month. Okay? But, uh, but you can still remember the Buddha was actually enlightened in spring. Um, and we can still eat the porridge in winter. Right? Okay, so today when we celebrate the Buddha's enlightenment, we eat... Uh, La Ba Zhou, right? We eat congee. But what was it that the Buddha actually ate during the Buddha's time? What was it that was given to him um, just before he was enlightened? What was it that you normally read about? What did he receive? Goat's milk. Um, somebody said milk rice, right? Okay. So um, there is many different versions in the sutra, and um, one of the most common version that is that he was given a bowl of um, milk, um, 
by Sujata, by this girl, Shabadas called Sujata, right? And so I went to look up the scripture and to see whether it's true. Uh, so I, I look up this particular sutra, it's called Fo Ben Xing Ji Jing. And you can find this sutra in uh, Fo Guang Zhan, Fo Guang Ben Yuan Zhang, okay? Uh, which is just published uh, recently. Uh, and you can also find it in the, if you want to read the sutra in English, it's in the Abhi, Abhiniskra, Abhiniskra Mana Sutra. It has been translated as Romantic Legend of Sakya Buddha. And it's available on Google Books. Okay, you can download the whole PDF on Google Books. All right. And um, in this particular sutra, it says that after the Buddha uh, was, had, had fast, fasted for six years, he decided that um, he didn't want to fast anymore and he is not leading him anywhere. And then he started to recall the time when he was young and his father took him out and he saw the plowing match and he was seated under a tree and he did some meditation. And he recalled the time when he was young and when he experienced meditation. And so he wanted to do that again. Okay. So um, he told his friend, a Brahman called Deva, I told his friend that he wants to take in food again. And he asked this Deva if he can prepare for him wheat and oil, milk and honey. Okay. And Deva says that he doesn't have these things, but he can look uh, for another Brahman for him. So he went to look up for another Brahman. This Brahman is called Senayana. And he has two daughters, one called Nanda, the other one called Bala. And he told his daughters to prepare wheat and honey, milk and oil. Okay, and so the two daughters hearing that were very happy and they prepared these things for him. And um, they went to the Buddha and they offered him. Uh, the Buddha asked for butter and oil. So uh, he took the butter and oil and the Buddha rubbed, rubbed it on his body. And as soon as he rubbed it on his body, uh, the butter and oil gets absorbed into his body. Like water gets absorbed into a sponge very quickly. Uh, so, and then you can imagine because he has been fasting for a long time. So he rubbed his body to get the food um, in the quickest manner. And uh, after rubbing it and after absorbing, uh, he regained his young and handsome look again. Uh, we know that uh, if you look at the sculpture of a fasting Buddha, he looks very thin and very old, right? But uh, after he regained his strength, he looks young and handsome, okay? Um, and after that, um, after receiving that offering, he was very thankful to, to, to the two daughters, and he asked the two daughters, uh, what is it that you would like to have? I can help you to fulfill your wishes. And the two daughters told him that they have heard of a Sakya prince by the name of Siddhartha and they want to marry him. And the Buddha hearing that, he says, well, I am Siddhartha, but I have given up my family and I have uh, made the vow to seek for enlightenment. Okay. And then the two daughters says, well, then... Uh, after your enlightenment, we would like to be your followers. And the Buddha agreed. And so the two daughters continued to bring him offering. And then after a few days, the Buddha was able to regain strength such that he was able to go and seek alms for himself. And he asked the two daughters to go home, to go back. And the Buddha started to go out and seek for alms. And then the second person that he met was the shepherd boy, okay? Uh, in many sutras, it was uh, a shepherd girl, uh, but in this sutra, it was a shepherd boy. And the shepherd boy gave him a bowl of goat's milk. And he, dr he drank that down, and he regained even more energy. And after regaining the energy, then a thought came to him, that he says that, uh, he thinks that he should be getting food for the purpose of enlightenment, okay? 
So this time, he wants to seek for alms, and he wants to take in the food for the purpose of enlightenment. Okay, so he told, uh, he went out and he went to find a village lord. And um, this village lord had two daughters, and um, they, uh, the Buddha, um, Prince Siddhartha told him that now I want to take in food only for the purpose of attaining enlightenment. And so the two daughters uh, went to prepare and they got the milk of 15 cows and um, the best rice that ca they can find. And they mixed the milk with the rice. And so it was a bowl of milk rice. Okay. And then when the Buddha went to seek for alms to that particular household, uh, the two daughters brought out that milk rice and it was Sujata uh, who brought it out to the Buddha. And when the Buddha saw that bowl of milk rice, he decided that that would be the food that would lead to his enlightenment. So he took that in. Okay, and then after that, he made the vow to be enlightened. Okay, so that was the story in this particular sutra. So the thing um, in this sutra that, that was given to him was the rice milk. Okay, so today we, um, every time uh, when we come to the 8th of the um, 12th lunar month, we will eat the laba congee, we will cook the laba congee, and uh, uh, we don't only commemorate the Buddha's enlightenment, but we also do that as part of charity and social welfare. And so we would um, eat the porridge and we would also distribute them to um, many different people and to tell and share with them the importance of um, the Buddha's enlightenment. Okay, so uh, eating lapa konji is not only a practice where we commemorate the Buddha's enlightenment, it is also a way where we do social welfare and charity work today. Okay. Right. So, I'd like to ask you a question. Is there any local Buddhist dishes? I know Di Sui Fang prepared prawn noodles today. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, three days ago, I came to Kuala Lumpur and they, they took me to this Thai vegetarian restaurant and I ordered Luo Han Zai. Uh, and it was very delicious. It was done in the Thai way. Uh, it's, um, it's probably a local adaptation of Luo Han Zai. Um, and uh, anybody knows why it's called Luo Han Zai? Okay, this particular dish is actually a, a, a stew uh, of 18 different ingredients. Okay, and the 18 represents 18 arahats. Okay, and 18 arahats is actually a feature of Chinese Buddhism. Okay, and, and so this particular dish was called uh, Luo Han Zai. And uh, there was a time in China when they wanted to give a feast to a group of monks and they didn't know what to cook. And so they came out with this dish whereby they put 18 different ingredients and they offer it to the monks. And so that's why, and then this, this dish become popular and over time it's called Lohan Zai. Right. Okay, next I want to talk about um, clothing. So, during the Buddha's time, um, the Buddha says that the robe that the monastics wear should be sold together uh, from discarded pieces of cloth, right? And in Chinese, we call fen sao yi. That means it's cloth that nobody wants, okay? And uh, the Buddha also said that you know, there are 10 kinds of rags that you can use for fen sao yi, for this monastic robe. Uh, it's chewed on by ox, or is not by rats, scorched by fire, soiled by menstruation, soiled by childbirth, offered at a shrine, left at a graveyard, offered in a petitional prayer, discarded by a king's officers, 
or brought back from a funeral. Okay, so you can see from this list, this is cloth that nobody wants, it's discarded. All right? And uh, during that time, um, the monks um, are not supposed to wear anything that's fanciful. Okay, they are not supposed to wear anything that's nice. And that's why the Buddha came up with this rule. Um, but at the same time, there are also devotees who want to make offering of rope to the monks. Okay, um, but because the Buddha has set this rule, so what the devotees do is they will place the rope on the street where the monks would walk by when they go for their alms procession for the monks to pick them up. Okay, because if they throw it on the streets, that means it's discarded. And then the monks can then pick them up. Okay, so it's quite different from today. Um, some devotees, uh, when they, um, it's not like, you know, 师父,我想要供养你, uh, 一块布, uh, it's not like that. Um, at, that, that, at, that at that time, uh, because the Buddha set this rule, um, the devotees throw it on the streets for the, for the monks. And then the Buddha also set a rule that the kasaya um, should be dyed in a bad color. Or in Chinese we say huai se. Okay, that means it's, it shouldn't be an attractive color and it should not be a fancy color. It should be a dull and um, a bad color. Okay. And the Buddha says that the, the ropes should be dyed in... Um, six different kinds of, uh, uh, you can use the roots or you can use the stems, the bark, the leaves, the flowers or the fruits to dye the rope. Okay, so this, this dye came from natural resources, right? And then the Buddha also set the rule that you can only have three pieces of cloth, three ropes, three pieces of ropes. And in the Vinaya, he it was recorded that on one cold winter night, the Buddha sat in the open air with one rope, and then he didn't feel it was cold. And then at the first watch of the night when it was ending, he began to feel cold and he put on a second rope. Okay? And then, uh, and then later on, into, um, deep into the night again, uh, he feel cold again, and then he put on a third rope. And then he passed through the night. And then he thinks, you know, he decided that that would be enough for the monastics. And so he set this rule that all monastics are allowed to have only three, three ropes. Okay? And these three ropes is, um, one is the outer rope, one is the upper rope, and one is the inner rope. Okay? And uh, the Buddha also said that you know, these three ropes that a monastic have, uh, they have to carry all the time, okay, uh, wherever they go. Okay, and why is that? Because once uh, a monk went to seek for alms, he wore his upper rope and his inner rope, and he left his outer rope. So when he seek for alms and when he came back, uh, his rope was stolen the outer rope was stolen. So the Buddha set the rule, you have to carry three ropes all the time. Okay. So in Chinese we say, san yi bu li shen. Oh, that means you have to carry all the time. And also if you look uh, at the scriptures, uh, we always say, uh, for example, se li fo, ji chong zuo qi, pian tan you jian, right? He zhang xiang fo, zuo shi yan, etc, etc. And so, uh, that means to bear the right shoulder. Okay, and we have to wear the ropes bearing the right shoulder. Okay, and why is that? Um, now bearing the right shoulder is actually not a Buddhist practice. It was an Indian tradition. And Buddhism ad 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 adopted that practice. And it actually means to be of service. Okay, and to, to listen to instructions and to pay respect, okay? So um, in the sutra, um, uh, if you look closely, uh, for example, Sariputra, uh, 舍利佛, 寄从坐起, 偏坦右肩, that means 
Sariputra got up from his seat and then he bears his right shoulder. Okay, that means when he's prostrating to the Buddha, then he bears his right shoulder. Okay, he doesn't have to bear it all the time. Okay, so um, in some of the Tibetan, uh, when the, for example, uh, some of the talks given by a Tibetan Lama, usually they will prostrate to the Buddha statue before they got on to their seat. And uh, you, you will notice that they don't actually have the rope, they don't actually bear the right shoulder all the time. They wear it um, across both shoulders, and when they make their prostrations, then they will put it across their left shoulder, and they will bear the right shoulder. And then they will make the three prostrations, and then after that, they will cover both shoulders again and go on to their seat and start the talk. Okay, so Pin Han Yu Jian is that you have that gesture of paying respect. Right? Okay, so um, these, there are three ropes. This is the inner rope, uh, and it covers the lower body. Uh, it's called Antavasa, and it's made from five stripes of cloth. And this is used um, for most of the chores that a monk would do. Okay. And then we have the Uttara Sangha, which is called um, the upper rope. And it has seven stripes in the Chinese rope. And it's worn when eating, prostrating, or listening to Dharma talks. Okay. And then we have this Sangati, which is the outer rope. And the outer rope is worn, uh, it's made from two layers of cloth, and is to keep warm and it can be used as a bedding or sitting mat, and it's worn when going out of the temple, okay, during the Buddha's time. And also, uh, the kasaya was, decide, uh, was designed by the Buddha to have patch fields, like patch-like fields, um, uh, few like patches, okay, that's be because um, the Buddha, once he was... Uh, he went out and he saw the field of Magadha and he saw that it was laid out uh, in um, strips and lines and um, the fields actually represent fields of merit. Okay, so the rope that the monastics wear uh, actually symbolize fields of merit. Okay, so when um, you make an offering to the monastic, you're actually planting a seed in your field of merit. Okay, so that's what it symbolizes. Okay, and then when Buddhism came into China, then the Buddhist rope has to be localized. Okay, for some reasons. Um, one is that China has a colder climate than India. Okay, so it's not practical to wear what the Indian monastics were wearing. Uh, and then it's also improper for the Chinese to bear their body. Okay, so Chinese are more conservative. Um, and, um, and then the, the, the temples, they have been to be self-sufficient. So that means they have to do their own farming and they have to do their own, um, uh, they grow their own crops for their own uh, food. Okay, so to wear the antavasa is actually not very practical. Okay, um, so to wear the five stripe robe is actually not very practical. Okay, so uh, in Chinese Buddhism, the rope was adapted into something more practical. Okay, so uh, this is the seven stripe rope, and then this is the nine stripe rope. Okay, the seven stripe rope is uh, actually the Uttara, uh, Uttara Sangha. This is uh, where this is worn when we go for uh, Dharma services, uh, usual daily Dharma services. And then this is the nice right rope and it's worn for more important occasions. And uh, during the ordination, we are actually given three ropes, the five, the seven, and the nice stripe. But we don't actually wear the five stripe rope, okay? Um, because it's not practical. Uh, the five stripe rope is supposed to be something that we wear for everyday use. And so if we have to wear the five stripe rope, it's not a practical attire, okay? so. Um, although we receive it during the ordination, we don't actually wear it. Okay, and then this is an even more elaborated form of the, the rope. 
the 25 stripe Hong Zhu Yi, the red robe. Okay, and this is worn by uh, anim anim eminent ma monks or the master of ceremony during a Dharma uh, a ritual. Um, uh, they would wear this Hong Zhu Yi. Okay, so uh, the three robes uh, that the Buddha said was actually uh, converted into the five, seven, and nine robes. Okay, and then, um, but we also have 25. Um, so from 5 to 25, there are actually nine different levels. Okay, and the nine, there are nine levels in between. So the nine levels actually represents uh, Jiu Ping, Jiu Ping Sang Sen. Okay, and so the five stripe represents Xia Ping Xia Sen, and the 25 stripe represents Shan Ping Shan Sen. And in between, you have nine different levels. Okay, this is a Chinese invention, Chinese creation. Another Chinese creation is the Chan Shan, which um, you see monastics wearing. This is something like the Antavasa. Okay, like I said earlier, the five stripe robe is not practical for everyday use. Okay, so the Chinese came up with what they call Chan Shan. And Chan Shan is actually transformed from Tan Dynasty, Tan Dynasty costume. Okay. So what you see us wearing this one, this is actually Tan Dynasty costume. It's the oldest fashion so far you see. Um, and on the collar you have lines on the collar. And uh, because on the Chan Shan we don't have these stripes, okay, that represents the fields of merit. So they were, uh, uh, they were actually here on the collar. So you have these lines, they actually represent the fields of merit. Okay, and then another invention is the Hai Qing. Okay, so you know the Chinese, um, they don't bear the right shoulder, right? So if they want to wear the rope across the left shoulder, then they have to wear something inside before wearing the rope. And so they came up with this Hai Qing. And the Hai Qing is actually adapted from the imperial rope. Okay, it's what the imperial princess uh, would wear. And the Hai Qing is very broad and very comfortable. And, um, and it's, it, the, the word Hai Qing actually has uh, two connotations. The word Hai. Hai means it's very broad. That means it's all embracing. It's, you're able to embrace everything. Okay? And Qing means Qing Chu Yu Lan. Okay? That means you surpass your forefathers. You improve generation to generation. Okay, so the two words means Hai Qing, that means it's all embracing and you can improve, you know, um, with every, every new generation. And um, if you notice, there are two colors in the Hai Qing. One is the black one. The black one is worn by both the monastic and the lay. And, and then we have the yellow one. The yellow one is usually worn by the abbot or the master of ceremony. Right. Um, and of course, we have some other monastic clothing like um, the Duang Gua and the Zhong Gua, and etc. And these are all Chinese uh, creations. And, and so uh, we've seen what the monastic uh, wear, the robe. And what about the lay people? The lay people wear uh, what you call Man Yi, right? And uh, it's actually uh, originated from this word Pata. Um, and it's uh, worn by the novice um, and then it was extended to include the lay people okay and the man yi we also call li chan yi that means a robe you wear for repentance and uh, according to the text you're not supposed uh, uh, you're only allowed to wear this during the dharma services if you do go to the market you're not allowed to wear to the supermarket uh, NTUC etc Okay, so, and we've seen, you know, what Chinese monastics wear. And what about Singaporean monastics? Um, in Singapore, it's very special, I think, also in Malaysia, because we have so many different traditions in Singapore. So, um, we wear whatever tradition uh, we follow. Okay, so, it's, uh, you have the Chinese tradition, and then you have the Tibetan tradition, and then you have the Theravada tradition. Okay, um, so, and my question is, is it possible for Singapore 
to have its own monastic robe, to come up with its own Singaporean flavored robe. Uh, the red and white one. <laughs> okay. Right. I think it's something that um, we can all think about. Um, and, uh, uh, and we can take the reference from we can take reference from what the Chinese have done. Um, but I guess it's a bit difficult because, first of all, um, Singapore is a multiracial, multi-religious place. So, unlike China, where um, China is, they only have like one dominant race, the Chinese. Um, so, and they have, you need to have imperial support. You need to have support from the government uh, to enforce a rule like this. And uh, for, for, uh, for the clothing to be localized in China, it actually took a few dynasties. Okay, so we know from uh, the time when uh, Buddhism entered China in year 64 until the time of Tang Dynasty, right? This is Tang Dynasty costume. Right, and Tan Dynasty is about 618 to 907, so 7th to 10th century. So it took about, like, on the average, I think, yeah, 600 years to 1,000 years, right, for Chinese Buddhism to come up with its own monastic robe. Okay, so it has that length of time. It, has, it needs that length of time, okay? Um, so I think there's many factors that we need to consider. Okay, right. So um, actually, I, as I was looking into this chapter, I have this question um, about localization. You know, do you think Singapore is able to develop its own style of Buddhism? Why and why not? Okay, uh, I think this. I would. Uh, I think this is a question that we can all. Or think about, and um, and 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 I. But I think there's a lot of factors that affect um, localization, and um, it has to be Buddhism has to be relevant to Singaporeans. Okay, so um, and uh, you need to have um, people who can actually make wise, very wise decision on how this would affect Buddhism in the future. Okay. Uh, I have about 15 minutes. Um, uh, I still have a lot to, to say. All right, housing. Next on housing. Um, in, during the Buddha's time, there are two main monasteries. Uh, one is the Bamboo Grove, and the other one is Jetavana, Bihara. Okay, this is how bamboo grove look like. Uh, now, there are still bamboo shoots, but the whole place is already in ruins. Uh, and this place has two origins in the sutra. One is that it was donated by King Bimbasara, and the other one was that it, had, it was donated by Kalandaka, uh, a wealthy elder. And in the sutra on past and present causes and effects, uh, this place was said to have 16 courts, each containing 60 chambers, 500 buildings, and 72 halls as teaching spaces for the Buddha. Okay, so you can tell it's a, a really huge place. The other Vihara is Jetavana Vihara. Okay, this is how it looks like now. And... Uh, this place was donated by Anatta Pind Pindada and it was uh, brought from Prince Jata. Okay, and that's why we call Jatavana. And Sariputra was the architect of this place. And this place was also a huge place. It's approximately 80 hectares. Uh, if you've been to uh, Foguanshan Buddha Museum, Foguanshan Buddha Museum is about 50 hectares. So this is even bigger than the Buddha Museum. Okay, and it's also fully equipped with um, many of these uh, facilities. Okay, and what does it 
mean by the word Vihara? Um, Vihara is actually a Sanskrit and Pali term. It means a Buddhist monastery. And it is a secluded place in which monks can walk in. Okay. Um, so they are near to the settlements uh, to, to allow the monks to be able to go and seek for alms. But it has to be secluded enough not to disturb the meditation. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Vihara is defined as a residence for the monks. It's also a center for religious work and meditation. And it's a center for Buddhist learning. And um, in, according to some references, they say that uh, there are actually five kinds of dwellings that were suitable for monks to live in. Um, but only the Vihara and the Guha, Guha is the cave, have survived. Okay, and this is the, the very first temple um, in China, right? Uh, and when the two monks came from the Western region or Central Asia to China, this place was actually an imperial guest house. Um, it's not a really a religious place, it's an imperial guest house. Uh, it's, for house it's for hosting foreign guests, okay? Um, so, the word Si, okay, uh, this place was formerly known as Honglu Si, and Si was actually a character to mean ministry, okay, government ministry. And, and then the emperor um, ordered that the word Si was to be added to the name of a temple, okay. And later times, uh, even the mosque came to use this word like Qingzhen Si, to mean a religious place. And then it was dropped off from the name of government ministries. Okay, so the word Si actually means a government ministry. Okay, then over time it became um, to mean a temple. Okay, and because the two monks traveled on a white horse, that's why it's called Bai Ma Si, but the original name was Hong Lu Si at that time. Okay, and if you look at the uh, Bai Ma Si, it looks very much like an imperial palace, right? And so that was the style that was adapted on Chinese temples, right? You have palace-like style. Okay, and you know, this is a very typical Chinese temple. It's, it's palace-like, and then it has two stories. Uh, and I've read somewhere that um, the two stories represent ultimate and relative truth, okay? So from the outside, you see two stories. But when you go into the temple, it only has one story, okay? So that is, there is only one truth, right? And also, you can see these bracket sets. They are also a part of Chinese temple architecture. Okay, and in Chinese, we call a temple a si yuan, right? And a si yuan can mean a vihara, Vihara is a dwelling place for the monks to walk in, a secluded place for the monks to walk in. And another meaning is Sangarama. Okay, Sangha means the Sangha community, the monastic community. Rama means a garden. Okay, so it's a garden for the monastic community. And uh, over time, the Sangarama is developed to include, to have uh, into a monastic complex with seven halls. Seven is a number to mean um, complete. Okay? So, a uh, monastic complex with seven halls, that is an ideal Buddhist setting. Okay? So, what are the seven halls? Um, the first one is the stupa or the pagoda to put the relics of the Buddha. Uh, the second one is the golden hall or the main hall uh, to put the Buddha statue, the Buddha image. And these two halls are, these two um, halls are supposed to be in the center of the complex. And then we have other halls like the lecture hall, the bell tower, the sutra repository, the monastic quarters, and the dining hall. Okay, and these few halls are to be built around the stupa and the golden hall. Okay. Okay. And I try to find a temple in China that is 
you know, that satisfy that criteria, but I couldn't find, I couldn't find a classic example. But I found, um, I found classic examples in Japan. So this is one of the temple. This is Shitennoji Temple in Osaka, Japan. Shitennoji means the four heavenly kings. Okay, and if you see, this is the pagoda. Behind the pagoda is the golden hall. Okay, and then the other structures are built around these two structures. Okay, so this is a very ideal classic example of a Sangharama. And this is the layout of the temple. So you have the pagoda here, you have the golden hall here, and then um, you have a covered walkway around these two structures, and then you have the entrance, the middle gate, and then you have several other halls. Okay, and uh, this was the setting for a Sangharama. Uh, of course, today, if you look in um, to, uh, temples in China, you couldn't really find something like this. Uh, but we do have the covered walkway, right? So if you go to Fo Guan Shan, Da Xiong Bao Dian, right? This would be Hua Zhang Xuan Men. Then you have the covered walkway that leads to Da Xiong Bao Dian. Okay, something like this. Okay, and the role of a monastery in China. Um, it has the role of a vihara, and uh, but uh, it also has added roles that it is used uh, to help to resolve the problems of the Chinese people, and for the temples to exist in China, in China, it has to play a role in the society. Okay, it cannot be there just simply. Um, for their own practice, it has to be relevant to the Chinese people. Okay, so one of the roles that they have to play is they have to resolve the people's daily problems. Okay, they have to, to help with the, the problems in um, you know, the Chinese community. And so um, that is also holding true to the original intents of the Buddha. Okay, so the Buddha's teaching was, um, was taught uh, to help to resolve the problems of sentient beings, okay? And so um, the role of the monastery, uh, it has grown also and developed over time uh, to uh, play its role as a vihara and also in social work and charity work, okay? So for a Chinese monastery in the society, they actually, has actually have added roles. Like uh, for example, it is a free school, okay? It serves as a free school and uh, they turn the wasteland into farmlands, okay, because they have to be self-sustained. Uh, uh, they have to go their own uh, agriculture, okay. So um, they would, the, these monasteries were turned into farmlands, etc. And also, also um, like they were used as emergency relief. When there is an emergency, um, people go to the monastery to seek for refuge, okay. So it's also used. Um, in this manner. Okay, so um, in uh, Chinese Buddhism, they were not used uh, mainly for religious purpose. They were also used for um, uh, social and um, uh, also to provide provide uh, relief aids. So uh, during that time, the monks also allow people to pawn money and material possessions for no interest. So the people can actually borrow money from the monks and uh, they are allowed to repay the money at their own time, for example. Okay, so what are some of the local relief aids that you have in Singapore for Guan Shan to make this place relevant to the Singaporeans? Bursary, right? You have the bursary. You have ci ai, um, child care, right? Any more? Okay, this is this is a picture I took at uh, Malaysia Wenjiao Zhongxin uh, in KL. Uh, they have a clinic, for example. They have a clinic at the Wenjiao Zhongxin. 
So people can go there not only for religious purpose, they can also get medical support from the temple, yes. And I, I also want to congratulate Singapore for Guanshan for receiving this very important award. Uh, uh, Community Spirit Awards, which means that you have Singapore uh, for Guanshan has actually made this place relevant to the Singaporean community um, in Singapore. And he I heard that uh, for Guanshan, Singapore for Guanshan is the only Buddhist organization to receive this award. So um, I I'd like to congratulate you for all the good work that you have done. Okay. Um, Okay, and then in the book, uh, Verbal Master also talk about um, how uh, monasteries in China today, they are listed only as a tourist attraction and a commercial venture, and they have admission fees. So it's really a pity that um, Chinese temples uh, have become uh, a tourist attraction or, or, or else, um, you know, they, they would have been um, able to, to maintain that kind of uh, uh, architecture and the spirit of a temple, how it should function as a temple. Okay. Okay, so um, what should a local temple look like? Right, so we have seen many of these Chinese temples. So what should uh, a Singaporean temple look like? Modern. Like Singapore for Guanshan. Right. And does it have to look like a temple, you mean? Doesn't have to look like a, a traditional temple. Wow, okay. That was the answer I was looking for. <laughs> okay, so um, this is Fo Guan San uh, Wen Jiao Zhong Xing in KL. So if you look at this building, if there is no Fo Guan Wen Jiao Zhong Xing on the building, it will look like just like any other buildings in the neighborhood, okay? So I think it, it, it has localized, okay? Because it blends into the neighborhood. This is Xin Ma Si, and uh, I was, I was, I gave, them, I gave this talk yesterday uh, at Xin Ma Si, and I asked them, what should a Malaysian temple look like? They told me it should look like Xin Ma Si. And so, Sima Si, it looks very much like a school, right? And, and I, I think this also um, uh, resonates with uh, Verbal Master's idea that a temple should be a school. Uh, it should be a place of education. Okay. Uh -huh. And for Guan Shan, from the outside, it looks like HDB. <laughs> yeah. Looks like Floyd Kini. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I think uh, this, you know, this, uh, the temples in in Singapore and Malaysia have have uh, localized very successfully. Okay, because uh, it is relevant to the people here. You know, it doesn't uh, it doesn't stand out to be like a. a um, it, is, it blends into the neighborhood, and also um, you have played a very important role in the community through your social work. Uh, so um, I think it's localization has been pretty successful. Uh, maybe if we have the red and white monastic robe, it would be even more special, maybe. <laughs> okay, uh, but if you look at Don Zen Temple, Dong Chan Si, in Malaysia, Jen Jarong, uh, it retains a look of a Chinese traditional temple. And um, I think it's because Dong Chan Si is the main branch in this Singapore Malaysian area. Okay? And so, as the main branch, it has to symbolize the heritage of humanistic Buddhism. And humanistic Buddhism is based on Chinese Buddhism. Okay, so it has the outlook of a traditional Chinese temple. Okay, and but the functions have slightly deviated from a Sangharama. Okay, it doesn't have the seven halls like we see in a traditional Sangharama. 
but it has the halls that um, is relevant to modern people. So you have the Mei Su Guan, the art gallery, you have the Buddhist college, you have uh, Cao Jing Tan Sutra Repository that we also have over here, right? So uh, it, the roles have slightly changed, okay? But I think it carries the spirit of a traditional uh, temple and how it, uh, how, how it looks like on the outside. And it has that symbol of heritage. Okay. Right, uh, I guess I don't have time um, for Buddhist arts anymore. Um, so so uh, I, I think I'll end my talk here. Uh, uh, if you have any yeah, questions, uh, you're welcome to ask. <laughs>